we're living in a golden era of television. Prestige television with insane view counts and even more insane budgets like Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon dominates the airwaves, propelled by a consistently high level of quality. Shows that aren't quite those cultural juggernauts like the CW slew of superhero shows or The Rings of Power still do insane numbers. We are also living in a golden age of animation, with Cartoon Network and HBO Max original shows going to levels of quality, both visual and inventive, unheard of before. Or at least we were until quite recently, before soulless corporate money grubbing ruined it, as it does all good things. Even the MCU, arguably the largest media franchise of all time, has transferred a good amount of its original stories in the modern day into the medium of TV, with shows like WandaVision and Loki being important parts of its overall story. And yet, with all this modern choice, all this legitimately impressive work, from the heights of Game of Thrones to the decadent luxuriousness of the Rings of Power and the continuity-driven metaverse of the MCU shows, I still remain the most taken by a humble little show from the Dark Ages, the late 90s, when basically nothing good was on TV. That show is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's not just me, either. Buffy the Vampire Slayer still has a passionate following to this day, even through a lot of troubling things coming out about it after its creation. It's an important show, influencing how TV panned out for the next few decades, with its influence still being felt in the current day. It's a show that there's a lot to say about, to the point where this Slate article from 2012 found that it was far and away the single IP with the most academic research papers written about it. There's clearly stuff to the show, and I want to look into that stuff. In 2017, I started writing a series called A Tour of Sunnydale, which I put on my shitty blog. The idea was that it would be a leisurely stroll through Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode by episode, where I'd have time to look into everything that makes the series tick. It was fine, but I got too bogged down in reviewing each episode individually, and I lost track of the bigger picture. The point of this series is to hopefully remedy that, taking a more bird's eye view and looking at every season of Buffy as a whole to see what it says, how it feels, and why I love this show so darn much at the end of the day. Before I jump in, I have to do an incredibly unfortunate bit of housekeeping. Joss Whedon, the main creative behind the series and someone who used to be a personal hero of mine, has turned out to be a pretty awful human being, allegedly abusing a lot of the actresses on set during the making of Buffy and several of his other projects. So I have this to say about his involvement in the show. I'm only going to say this out loud in this particular video, but it will be on screen in text form at the start of every video in this series. This is a series of videos about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I love this show, and I think it's great. The creator of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and the person responsible for a lot of the best parts of the show, Joss Whedon, is a good artist. He is also a bad person. The things that were allegedly done on set during the production of Buffy were horrible. As much as I love the end product, it was not worth the torment the people working on it were put through. As much as Buffy has meant to me over the years, if I could snap my fingers to make Buffy never have happened, I'd do so in a heartbeat. Because I'm taking a critical look at the show, I'm going to have to talk about Whedon's work and engage with it. This will result in praise of his work, because it's often very good. Praising his work is not an endorsement of Whedon as a person or of his actions. At the same time, I do not want to bog down this video by constantly having to acknowledge Joss Whedon is a bad person any time I mention him. That would be tedious for me to make and for you to listen to. As such, I'll only mention it when it's relevant. Assume that all praise of Whedon's work is tempered by an inaudible condemnation of his character. Please be chill. The proper ordering of the seasons from best to worst is a contentious topic among the Buffy fandom. There's a bunch of seasons that are in contention for the best one. There's rabid fans of season 5, ardent stands of season 2, obstinately contrarian defenders of season 6, and objectively correct lovers of season 3. There's also a bunch in contention for worst season. People unimpressed with the constant middling blandness of season 4, people who think season 6's high highs don't make up for its incredibly low lows, or the correct people who are very unhappy with the ending that season 7 gave the show. 
All that being said, however, I think there's one thing no one will argue against, and that's that season one is one of the weaker ones. There's a decent contingent who think it is the weakest one, and it's easy to understand why. It's by far Buffy at its shoddiest and most unsure in itself, still figuring out what exactly the show is, and often even who the characters at its core are. It's also just sort of badly produced in a lot of instances. The show had an incredibly tight budget and a showrunner new to television, and it really shows. Everything is visibly ramshackle and bodged together, and the tentative nature of a lot of what's being done behind the scenes means you get weird stuff that, on a rewatch, comes across as incredibly out of place when compared with the rest of the show. That said, it's also clear that while there's some growing pains, hey, hey roll credits, to be ironed out, Buffy was always a show with a clear vision behind it. Joss Whedon often speaks in interviews about the base idea that eventually blossomed into Buffy, that of the classic blonde girl in peril in a monster movie turning out to be stronger than the monster and kicking its ass. This eventually would crystallize into a movie script for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but various behind-the-scenes productions, hang-ups, and money issues would eventually wrest the script and the right to the name from Whedon's hands into the hands of the Kazooie siblings. Incidentally, that's why their names are in the credits of every episode of the show, even though they never touched it in any way, as far as I know. Whedon's control over production of the film would be minimal, and the script would see severe rewrites, to the point that Whedon would eventually walk off set in disgust and spend a long time after the popularity of the series skyrocketed shit-talking the movie. The Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie has been seeing a bit of a renaissance recently, but I still think it's a charmless, cynical cash-in that refuses to do what makes the series beautiful and wholeheartedly embrace its own silly premise, instead playing out with an irony poisoned, too cool for the silly stuff, detached cynicism that sucks it dry of any potential enjoyment. As such, the start of the very first real episode of Buffy feels like an incredibly potent statement. It's that defenseless blonde girl thing, but turned on its head even from Whedon's initial concept. This time, the defenseless blonde girl doesn't just turn out to not be defenseless, the twist is that she's actually the monster. The original plan for this character, Darla, was to have her die at the end of the first two-parter, but she lived so that she could eventually play a role in a later season one episode. I'm glad she did, because this scene is such an iconic mood-setting scene that really does make a statement of the attitude the entire rest of the show will have, and Darla really is the star of it. She does eventually die in season one, but she still goes on to be an iconic part of the Buffyverse by being a major character on Angel. It's only fitting that the first real character we see on screen isn't just a throwaway. The first episode, Welcome to the Hellmouth, is part of a two-parter with episode two, The Harvest. Two-parters are a staple of the show, and they're almost always highlights. I'd say this opening two-parter is definitely that. It comprises two of my top four episodes of the season, but it's also got something that's completely unique, this to-be-continued screen, which never reappears after this point. It's just immediately obvious on a rewatch that the show hasn't quite found its feet yet. I mean, who can blame it? It's basically a newborn baby at this point. A lot of the characters aren't quite there yet. Buffy and Giles get nailed almost immediately. They appear on screen fully formed as the characters that we'll see through the rest of the show. Anthony Stewart Head as Giles is my pick for the best actor on Buffy, and he just completely trounces everyone else in this first season, with the possible exception of Sarah Michelle Gellar's Buffy. Can you tell me if there's a vampire in this building? Maybe. You should know. Even through this mass and this din, you should be able to sense them. Well, try. Reach out with your mind. You have to hone your senses, focus until the energy washes over, until you you feel every particle of it. There's one. Where? Right there, talking to that girl. <laughs> you don't know. Oh, please. Look at his jacket. He's got the sleeves rolled up and the shirt. Deal with that outfit for a moment. It's dated. It's carbon dated. Trust me, only someone living underground for 10 years would think that was still the look. But you didn't hone. Head immediately embodies Giles, this sort of nervous, bookish guy whose exposition guy front regularly crumbles to reveal a deep inner life. 
In one of the director commentaries, Joss Whedon talks about how most of the people who came in to read for Giles interpreted him as an old stuffy guy, just your standard exposition machine, and what made Anthony Head's Giles unique is that he gave him a subtle, youthful, sexy, slightly unsure energy, like he also didn't fully have his own life all figured out yet. I think that's a perfect description of Giles. While the first season will basically treat him as that stereotypical exposition dispenser, he comes across incredibly likeable, because you do get a sense of him as a person, and when later seasons explore him in more depth, that will really pay off. The characters that are shaky are… well, pretty much everyone in the main cast outside Buffy and Giles. Alison Hannigan has just as good a grasp of who Willow will become as Anthony Head does of what Giles currently is, but Willow as written on the page at this point is a slightly different character to the one Hannigan is playing. Hannigan's Willow is shy and vulnerable, sure, but she's not a pushover, and she radiates a core of inner strength that's completely missing from this early episode Willow, who lets Cordelia walk all over her and preemptively bullies herself on Buffy's behalf when she expects her to be mean to her. Uh, hi. Willow, right? Why? I, I mean, hi. Uh, did you want me to move? Why don't we start with, hi, I'm Buffy. I think this is a dissonance that can be easily explained away through production issues. Willow's casting was a really hard choice for the production crew, and Hannigan was actually a last minute pick that had to be fought hard for with the network. I think maybe part of why this doesn't quite sit as well as it can is that Hannigan's Willow was different from how the character was originally envisioned, and the writing took a while to adapt to her performance. You can actually see what I imagine is a closer semblance of what Willow was initially meant to be like in the show's unaired pilot, where Willow is played by Riff Regan, the only role recast for the actual TV release. Regan's interpretation is softer, lacking that tough inner core that Hannigan always gives Willow, and replacing the show's version of Willow's often accidental humour with a sort of more open jokiness, more in line with Buffy and Xander. It's a really interesting glimpse into what could have been, and it's both on YouTube and only 25 minutes, so I'd say it's worth a watch. I'm going to have a lot to say about Xander as we slowly make our way through the season. While he occasionally shows glimpses of the character he becomes, and immediately has all the surface mannerisms and charm of that character, I really don't think we get to meet the Xander Harris I love so deeply until the second season. Xander's introduction in Welcome to the Hellmouth is perhaps the least coherent out of anyone's, since he's briefly portrayed as cool, which is the last word anyone on this planet would use to describe Xander, himself included. His introduction is him totally radically skateboarding dude woe as this banging 90s rock tune plays, and it's really impossible to shake the feeling that he's meant to be hip and suave. He never skateboards again, which according to Whedon was actually apparently because filming skateboarding was too hard for the crew to do, and he very quickly devolves into the least cool member of the group, sort of the dumb funny one. This means that whatever's out there still needs a healthy intelligent brain. In other words, I'm safe. Unfortunately, it just doesn't feel like that's what he's meant to be, because that first impression sticks in your head really hard, even when just one episode later he's wearing this monstrosity of a green mushroom shirt that I think is emblematic of him as a character. That's what I picture Xander wearing when I think of him anyway. Joss Whedon has often said that Xander is the character he sees the most of himself in, and I wonder whether that has anything to do with this weirdly self-indulgent introduction. Maybe there's a bit of wish fulfillment seeping through the cracks here. There's also his crush on Buffy. I hate it. More later. Finally, about two-thirds of the way into the episode, we're introduced to Angel, who I really like. For now. I'm a bit of an Angel anti-fanboy, at least outside his own show, which he does carry almost single-handedly for a long time, but his presence and general vibe in the first few episodes is great, which actually makes this a really bad introduction because he's wildly out of character. Angel is defined throughout the rest of Buffy by his brooding, but that's completely lacking in these episodes. 
Angel here is snarky and playful. He comes across more like a mischievous trickster type of character than the dark and brooding one that he's the living stereotype of for the rest of the show. Who are you? Let's just say I'm a friend. Yeah, well, maybe I don't want a friend. I didn't say I was yours. It's likeable, and I think this plays into David Boreanaz's strengths as an actor way more than the default place that Angel is in during his tenure on Buffy. David Boreanaz is incredible in livelier, more honest roles. He's eventually absolutely brilliant as Angelus, Angel's gleefully evil alter ego, where he manages to make the role equal parts can be fun and legitimately terrifying. When Angel gets his own show and gets to show off his dorky, socially awkward weirdo side rather than just being hot and brooding all the time, he instills the character with an incredible amount of relatable charm and personality that is a central pillar of that show's appeal. It's only when he's doing the Edward Cullen routine that Boreanaz's is acting falls very flat, which is unfortunately an overwhelming majority of what he'll be doing while on Buffy. There's also just stuff in the writing that makes me think they didn't quite know where they were going with Angel yet. There's a line about him expecting Buffy to be bigger and more muscular. The truth is, I thought you'd be taller, or bigger muscles and all that. You're pretty spry though. But that doesn't make sense because Angelus has fought and killed Slayers before, and should know that they outwardly look like normal teenage girls. It just feels like maybe a lot of what Angel became wasn't set in stone when this episode was being written, and that the Angelus twist was an idea from later on in production. That is about it, other than introducing the season's villain in The Master, plus the excuse for why all these demons keep popping up. There's a Hellmouth under Sunnydale which attracts mystical energies. Welcome to the Hellmouth and the Harvest is honestly a relatively unremarkable piece of television. It's sort of the most vanilla possible Buffy story. She just has to fight a bunch of vampires trying to do a ritual. There's not a twist and no unique high concept that sets it apart, like there being an invisible girl, people's nightmares coming to life, or chocolate that's making adults act like teenagers. It's solid and it demonstrates the basics of a lot of what Buffy will become especially with the character of Jesse, who's presented as one more of the gang and promptly killed off in the second episode, showing the show's intent for subverting expectations. Famously, Whedon's intention was to have him be in the opening credits to make it look like he was going to be in the show for the long haul and have his death be more surprising. Contrary to popular belief though, the reason to not do it wasn't actually contractual. It was simply too expensive to create another credit sequence. One last scene that I want to highlight is this one, where Buffy's mother Joyce tries to ground Buffy. It's a really great scene carried by Christine Sutherland's kind and gentle performance, and it really shows off Joyce as a good person struggling in a difficult situation, trying to do the best she can for her daughter. But the thing I like the most is this incredibly unsettled line about the end of the world. This is really, really important. I know. If you don't go out, it'll be the end of the world. It's incredibly on the nose. Hey, it really would be the end of the world. <laughs> but I take it as sort of a mission statement for the show. One phrase that you hear a lot around Buffy is school is hell. I don't know who coined it. I've been unable to find a source, but it refers to the show's attitude of essentially making metaphorical monsters out of problems high schoolers face. The very next episode will have an abusive mom who resents her daughter's youth turning out to be a witch who magically swaps bodies with said daughter. Eventually, we'll have a group of bullies be possessed by a pack of magical hyenas, and a very special episode about the dangers of meeting people on the internet will have a cyber demon pose as Willow's boyfriend. But I like that the show is upfront about this. It's a sort of nod to teenagers that it actually does get them, that it cares about their worries and won't dismiss them, while not being unkind to Joyce, since in this scene she's honestly doing a very reasonable thing in an incredibly kind way. I don't think the angstiest, most rebellious teen in the world could find it in themselves to be angry at Joyce for this. 
this type of show will usually either not understand teens' problems or take the teen's side in a way that makes the adults look like the bad guys for sometimes not understanding, and Buffy refuses to do either of those things. I think a major reason why it's got the staying power it does is the empathy the show extends to both sides of the equation. As a teen, when I first watched the show at season 1, Buffy's age, 16, or maybe 17, I'm not entirely sure, it was incredibly easy to relate to a lot of the things the show was talking about, even this early on. And now, as an adult, it still feels like there's stuff here for me. There's a perspective that's more mature and complete than just siding with teens unconditionally. Oh, also, the visual metaphor of this chest, where Buffy's girly stuff covers up her Slayer stuff, neither side less important or true to her than the other, but one hidden under the other, is absolutely brilliant. One of the best visuals of the entire show, if you ask me, I just really like this. Once we're out of the opening two-parter, we jump into four Monster of the Week episodes in a row. These are episodes that are mostly standalone, with maybe some tangential character evolution that sticks. These form the bulk of Buffy, and I'd argue a strong part of its central appeal. My preference for early Buffy over late Buffy comes largely from the gradual decrease in Monster of the Week episodes that happens after the end of Season 3. While if you ask me to list my top 10 episodes of Buffy, you'd rarely actually get Monster of the Week stuff in the list, it makes for an important cushion between the larger emotional beats. It's lower stakes material where you just get to spend time with these characters and fall in love with them. The episodes driving the overarching plot may be the most effective, but a lot of their effectiveness comes from the breathing room that the Monster of the Week episodes provide in between. Plus, there's great Monster of the Week stories to be told. The strength of this format is that school is hell attitude I was just talking about. I think while the very best episodes of the show are almost universally plot-centric, most of the plot-centric episodes that aren't one of those very best tend to be mediocre, and your average Monster of the Week episode is pretty strong. I actually really, really like the third episode, which, which is maybe the definitive Buffy Monster of the Week episode in just how self-contained it feels, and how logical the progression of events is. Buffy joins the cheer squad, which is something that makes perfect sense for her to do, and then mysterious stuff starts happening, like a girl spontaneously combusting. Meanwhile, the one-off character for the episode, Amy, is acting weird and talking a lot about how great of a cheerleader her mother is. So. We look into her, discover she's probably a witch, and go to her house, where we're met with the twist that it's actually the mother in Amy's body, jealous of Amy's youth and unable to let go of her glory days as a cheerleader. There's a showdown with the witch, the day is saved, and we live happily ever after, except for Amy's mother who meets one of the most horrifying fates imaginable. It's an incredibly workmanlike episode that flows really, really well. It also happens to be arguably the best looking episode in season one other than the finale. There's so many memorable visuals here from this cauldron and the cheerleading tryouts. A lot of them make it into the show's credits just on the basis of how memorable they look. The episode also has really coherent themes. Both Amy and Buffy are struggling with their mother's expectations of them, with the mothers wanting them to, in a way, become copies of them. So Amy's mother literally becomes Amy. There's themes of child abuse with Amy's mum, and it's contrasted against Giles, who's quickly becoming a fantastic father figure for Buffy, and who springs to her defense. You've got to go. She's going to be home soon, and you... This girl is very sick. Now you will shut up and you will listen to me. It's not anything mind-blowing, but it's really solid all the way through, and in a certain way it's to Buffy's Monster of the Week episodes what the opening two-parter is to the plot-centric episodes. A really solid vanilla baseline to build off of and get progressively wackier with. I'm going to break episode order and talk about the next episode, Teacher's Pet, in parallel with another episode from later in the season that I think it shares a lot in common with, episode 8, I Robot, You Jane. These are two of the most reviled episodes in the entire show, and I personally think with good reason. They're both bad, and they're sort of bad in similar ways. They're both yet another subcategory of episode, this time character-centric episodes, which I think are pretty self-descript. Teacher's Pet is a Xander episode, and I, Robot Eugene is a Willow episode. 
This is tangential to how they're bad, though, and that's that both of their central premises, both of the aspects of teenage life that they choose to explore, are poorly chosen and badly handled. Teacher's Pet follows the gang as they investigate a she-mantis, a giant bug disguised as a hot substitute teacher who is using her human form's looks to attract virginal male students and force them to fertilize her eggs. It's a pretty shoddily made episode, with some awful special effects, a dead-end cliffhanger that goes nowhere, and a bunch of really unfunny bad jokes, but the thing that makes it uniquely bad is its themes. It's used to explore two things. Xander's insecurity over his virginity, which is done pretty well, it's contrasted with the insecurity of the seemingly experienced Blaine, and it leads him to doing stupid things that hurt his friends when no one but him seems to actually care about it. I see. So if she's not human, she's... Technically, a big bug. (laughs) This sounds really weird. I'm aware of that. It doesn't sound weird at all. I completely understand. I've met someone, and you're jealous. What? There's also the theme of teachers sexually assaulting students, which... is not done well. It's not that Buffy can't handle dark and sensitive themes. It absolutely can, and it regularly does. Buffy's really brilliant arc in season 6 is centered on her desire to die and struggling with PTSD and depression. There's episodes about dealing with grief after the death of a loved one, violent essay by someone you trust, and dealing with terminal illness. Hell, I just got done praising Witch, and that episode's partially about child abuse. The issue is that Teacher's Pet's treatment of this subject matter is insensitive, and it almost feels like an afterthought. There's a straight-up joke about how Xander's about to get raped. Oh yeah, here it comes. What? What's happening? How do you like your eggs, bro? Over easy or sunny side up? Eggs? And it just feels incredibly icky. The conclusion is just something along the lines of don't sleep with your teacher's kids and the condemnation doesn't feel like it lands hard enough on the monster. Which is weird, because there's some really great bits where the metaphor feels like it should be landing. Like here, where she's still acting flirtatious while openly in monster form. Miss... French? Please, call me Natalie. The issue here is that the condemnation isn't on the she-mantis Miss French. She's never really portrayed as doing anything other than what a monster would do. Instead, a lot of the blame seems to land on Xander and Blaine, who are presented as moronically falling into her trap when really she's abusing a position of power over minors who can't consent. As such, the takeaway putting part of the blame on Xander and Blaine, especially after their insecurity is portrayed as valid and understandable, comes across as sort of disgusting and also obnoxiously preachy and puritanical. Those last two are also the same pitfall that I robot you Jane falls into. I, Robot You Jane is about there being a demon on the internet. Giles accidentally has Willow scan a book, which contains a sealed demon, computerizing him and giving him control over the entire internet. He uses this to wreak havoc and to pretend to be a boy interested in Willow. The gang discovers this, fights some cultists, fights the demon in a robot body, and we're done. We're also introduced to Miss Callender, the computer science teacher at Sunnydale High, who is secretly a techno-pagan and will play a small role through the rest of the season and become pretty important in season 2. There's some good stuff in I, Robot, You, Jane, namely a lot of the interactions between Miss Callender, who represents embracing technology, and Giles, who is a bit of a Luddite. Miss Callender explaining how she sees computers as merely an extension of the magic of the real world is fantastic. Who are you? I teach computer science at the local high school. A profession that hardly lends itself to the casting of bones. Wrong and wrong, Snobby. You think the realm of the mystical is limited to ancient texts and relics? That bad old science made the magic go away? Hmm. The divine exists in cyberspace, same as out here. The conversation in the end of the episode that the two have, where Giles explains why it's important to him that his method of learning is smelly, is a great moment which shows off that both parties have good points. Honestly, what is it about them that bothers you so much? The smell. Computers don't smell, Rupert. I know. Smell is the most powerful trigger to the memory there is. A certain flower or a 
whiff of smoke and bring up experiences long forgotten. Books smell musty and, 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 and rich. The knowledge gained from a computer is a, it, it, it has no, no texture, no, no context. It's, it's there and then it's gone. If it's to last, then, then the getting of knowledge should be uh, tangible. It should be um, smelly. The two also happen to have fantastic on-screen chemistry, and they're a ton of fun to watch interacting. Unfortunately, that's about all the nuanced discussion that winds up happening in this episode. Everything else pretty much just reads like an anti-internet PSA, from Buffy telling Willow he could be different than you think. to the weird techno-cultist who talks about how the only reality is virtual. If you're not jacked in, you're not alive. I'm jacked in. I'm jacked in. I'm jacked in. And then starts murdering people with electric wires. It's over the top in what's honestly a pretty fun way, but it doesn't feel like it's trying to engage the audience on its level. I'm pretty sure I'm laughing at this episode and not with it. The only stuff that really gives the internet a fair shake is the Miss Calendar stuff, and I suspect that that may have been written separately by Joss Whedon or some other writer who was privy to the larger picture of the show, because it's largely irrelevant to the plot, better than most of the rest of the episode, and it feels like it's only there because we're going to need to have Miss Calendar set up for later in the show. It's condescending, and it takes the school as hell angle from being sympathetic and empathetic to teenagers into being openly preachy. There's sections here that honestly feel like I'm reading a chick tract, and it's aged about as well as most chick tracts have, since 20 years later we're living in a world where the internet is perfectly normal and one in three relationships start online. These two episodes are an interesting contrast to one another in that they fail in a way Buffy very rarely does. Teacher's Pet doesn't take its premise seriously enough, while I, Robot You Jane takes it way too seriously, and both manage to come across as preachy and unsympathetic in a way that no other episode of Buffy that isn't trying to get government money ever does. We're going to take a brief break from discussing episodes now because I want to stop to talk about the people writing the episodes instead. With the things coming out about Joss Whedon, a large proportion of Buffy's fanbase, being a show that through its content invites a tolerant feminist progressive audience, has taken to looking for a way to justify still liking the show despite its association with Whedon. And the answer a lot of them have come to has taken the form of minimizing his role with many articles coming out about how Whedon was never actually that big a factor in Buffy's success, etc, etc. This comes across to me as cope posting. It's simply people who are uncomfortable admitting they like something made by a bad person, and I think it's a dangerous attitude to take to media criticism. By all accounts, including those of the people on set, Whedon was the main driving creative force behind Buffy, especially during its early seasons, and trying to deny this just seems like a denial of reality. Something good that has come out of this, though, is the recognition that Buffy, like any long-running TV show, is a collaborative effort, and that putting all the praise at Whedon's feet is unwise. I think it's important to acknowledge and celebrate, or maybe castigate, the rest of the creative crew that made the show what it was. Unfortunately for me, this is actually pretty hard to do in the first season. Most of the key creatives who'd come to define Buffy and develop their own sub-niches within the show aren't present here. The only writers for season 1 that would go on to write more than 4 episodes of the show are Joss Whedon himself with 24 episodes, David Greenwalt with 8, and the writing duo Rob Deshotel and Dean Batali at 5. The rest of the season is written by people like Dana Reston, the writer of Witch, which happens to be her sole writing credit on Buffy, or the duo of Matt Keane and Joe Rinkemeyer, who wrote The Pack and would only return to write Inca Mummy Girl early in season 2. I think this early unstable crew is probably a big reason as to why season 1 often feels as patchy as it does and as inconsistent as it is with the tone of following seasons. 
It's written by a rotating crew of people who don't really stick around past this season, and as such didn't really leave their mark as deeply on the show's DNAs as some of the recurring names we'll start seeing next season. It's a shame, too, because there are some really great episodes written by these people. Dana Reston's script for Witch is one of my favorites of the season, which makes her incredibly short and unknown tenure as a TV writer really sad and unexpected. With this level of talent, I would expect her to either have had a long career up to this point or have a bright future ahead of her. Reston's largest writing contribution to any show was five scripts for the largely unknown 1994 sitcom The Nanny, and other than that she's only contributed one episode each to seven different shows, none of which I'd heard of other than Buffy, of course. After some producing credits on The Nanny and selling two scripts in 1999, she all but disappeared from the TV world. I hope you're doing okay, Dana. Perhaps the single most unfortunate writing credit in the show's history is the duo Ashley Gable and Thomas A. Swyden, responsible for Just I, Robot You, Jane, and another season one episode we've not got to, Out of Mind, Out of Sight. These are two of the least liked episodes of the season, with I, Robot You, Jane being one of the worst liked episodes of the entire show. I think the thing tying both these episodes together is perhaps an over-enthusiasm for the school as hell angle both of them feeling partially like PSAs. I already talked about I, Robot, You, Jane, but Out of Mind, Out of Sight also has a strong bullying bad message, which makes both of them feel really preachy and like they're talking down to the audience. I do want to acknowledge that this writing duo does seem to have a really good grasp on the characters, though, with I, Robot, You, Jane having some really strong interactions between the Scooby gang and Out of Mind, Out of Sight being inarguably the best Cordelia will be in the whole season. I think if they'd stayed on, this writing duo could have been redeemed. If they'd just hit the metaphor a little less on the nose and preachily, their grasp on the characters could have made for some really good material. And Ashley Gable did go on to have a prolific career in TV, with her episodes and Buffy being her first ever writing credits. She'd go on to write a whole lot of other scripts, specializing in detective shows, and she'd have a pretty big hand in the successful and acclaimed detective drama The Mentalist, for which she'd provide 12 whole episodes, before moving on to be an incredibly prolific TV producer. You can feel this detective leaning of hers in I, Robot, You, Jane, and Out of Mind, Out of Sight, as they're two of the episodes most focused on the Scoobies figuring out a mystery. Thomas Swyden only has a couple more writing credits to his name before disappearing forever from TV in 1999, though. Returning back from the episodes and moving on from I, Robot, You, Jane and Teacher's Pet, I have to say that I don't think either of them are the worst episodes in the season, unfortunately, because episode 5, Never Kill a Boy on the First Date, exists. It's a really weird one, because it's technically a Monster of the Week episode, but it fails in the way that are typically reserved for the bad plot-centric episodes. This one's a little plot-significant in that it introduces the Anointed, a character that the show will pretend is important until giving up on him a few episodes into season 2, but that's largely tangential to its central conflict and its storyline, which is that of Buffy trying to date this guy Owen. Owen is the episode's largest problem, and represents something that will be a recurring issue. A lot of the guys Buffy likes who don't have a connection to the supernatural tend to be bad characters. Owen is a caricature of a nice sensitive boy, going endlessly on about how much he likes poetry, and he's just a doormat when Buffy has to blow him off for slayer business. The idea is that behind that facade, there's a thrill-seeker who Buffy accidentally brings out to the surface, but he feels so incredibly artificial and engineered to be a dreamboat that my only reaction is rolling my eyes, even watching this as a teenager. I don't know, maybe if I'd been a girl or attracted to guys when I first watched this episode, I might have gotten what the appeal was for teenagers at least, but Owens just seemed absolutely insufferable to me, and he drags what's otherwise a really boring script into being pretty unwatchable. This feels like an out-of-touch, casually misogynist older guy's idea of what teenage girls are attracted to, and so much of the episode hinges on him that none of it works. I'm not convinced it would have worked either way, however, because Never Kill a Boy on the First Date is just ridiculously boring. We're back at that standard Welcome to the Hellmouth plot. Buffy gets wind that a big vampire is gonna rise, so she has to go kill him. But 
there's none of the excitement of the starting two-parter. It just feels like we're going through the motions already. It's really dull. And the one thing that's meant to make this unique is that she's juggling dating Owen with doing Slayer things. But I have no investment in the Owen subplot, and I'm frankly just waiting for the episode to be over. The introduction of the Anointed is meant to make this episode significant, but the Anointed does nothing important in the episode, the rest of the season, or his brief tenure during season 2, and is just a waste of a character, played by a below average even by the standard of kid actor's kid actor, so it's just a wash. There's basically nothing redeemable here other than this idea that being a slayer is hard to reconcile with having romantic entanglements. Admittedly, it is important to have an episode like Never Kill a Boy on the First Date in this season though, because this romance is hard for slayers idea is something that will be important in episode 7, which is an angel-centric episode creatively named Angel. It makes the character of Angel, who's revealed to be a vampire in that episode, a logically perfect choice for Buffy's romantic partner. It's even set up in Never Kill a Boy to some extent, since Owen being implicitly jealous of Angel is a part of that episode's plot. Angel is the one and only mid-season plot-centric episode in this season, moving the status quo in major ways. It's just a shame that by this point Angel is well and truly a tedious character to watch on screen. Completely gone is the playful trickster type we got introduced to in the first episode, and he's replaced by a prototype Edward Cullen, a brooding, humorless plank of wood. What does your family think of your career choice? They're dead. Was it vampires? It was. I'm sorry. It was a long while ago. So this is a vengeance gig for you. You even look pretty when you go to sleep. I feel awful criticizing David Boreanaz's performance, because when I say that I think his performance really carries the Angel TV show, I'm not exaggerating. I know he can be really fantastic when given material that plays to his strengths, but this just isn't doing that, and he really struggles to give Angel, the character, any sort of charm whatsoever. Dark and reserved is simply not a strong suit in Boreanaz's acting repertoire. He does charming in a playful way better, and though he'll get better at it as the show goes on, it really lets down the character of Angel, and as a result, a pivotal pillar of the show's early plotlines. Angel, the episode, not the character of the show, this is going to get irritatingly confusing irritatingly fast, needs to be a knockout episode because a lot of early Buffy is going to be built on the basis of this relationship, and it's really unfortunate that it's just not that great. It's shocking how little the two have interacted before this point, and even more shocking how little interest Buffy has shown in Angel as a romantic partner. I'm more willing to believe that she'd go out with Xander than swoon over Angel, but suddenly you get all these oh no we shouldn't kisses and alleged sexual tension, and I just don't buy it. These two simply don't have the sort of history that would lead me to believe they act this way. If Angel was at least charismatic on screen, I'd maybe be fine with it. I see what Buffy would see in the Angel of the first two episodes, or the Angel who runs a detective agency in LA three seasons from now, but I certainly don't see what anyone would see in the plank of wood with a frowny's face scribbled on it that David Boreanaz is currently struggling to portray. It's a shame, too, because Angel the episode, is actually pretty okay outside of the fact that I don't believe Angel and Buffy have any reason to feel anything for one another. This is the first time since the start of the show that the Masters felt like the antagonist of an episode, though he does admittedly use Darla as a proxy. And it's honest good fun. Buffy is one of those shows that's incredibly fun to discuss, because there's all these categories with in-joke names where you get to pick your favourite and rank them. What's your favourite season? Your favourite Scooby? How about your favourite Big Bad? And this is sort of where the Big Bad slot is solidified. The Big Bad, for those who aren't familiar, is the fan name for the main villain of each season, who will usually be introduced early on, and then spend most of the season lurking in the background, only interacting with the heroes rarely and causing trouble covertly. I don't think the idea of a Big Bad would be nearly as set in stone for the show as it is without the Master, who's sort of the baseline with whom every other Big Bad is to be compared. 
The Master is the most standard main villain we'll ever get in this show. He's just a powerful and influential vampire who is introduced early, lurks, and then gets killed in a finale. And a lot of the future season's big bads will be defined in large part by the ways they differ from the baseline established by the Master. Season 2 plays with the concept by having the big bad constantly rotating, and eventually settles on having Angelus, which creates drama. Season 3's Big Bad is genial and friendly in Spider is Evil, and he's capable of forming heartfelt human connection. Season 4's twist is that its Big Bad is just incredibly shit in every conceivable way, and so on and so forth. The Master has his own value as a character standalone, he's incredibly fun. Matt Metcalf absolutely kills it in the role by giving him a friendliness and a playfulness that contrasts really well with his constant mutilating of his own minions to make for a character who is honestly a joy to have on screen. Ah, uh, Colin, you failed me. Tell me you're sorry. I'm sorry. There. That wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, hold on. You've got something in your eye. The Master may not have that much going on, there's no interesting dynamic with Buffy or any of the Scoobies, he doesn't drive the plot of that many episodes, there's no depth here the way there is with most of the big bads after this point, but his real value is as a baseline for future villains to work off of, and the theatrics of his presence makes him work, despite how little is actually going on with him. For as nothing of a character as he is once he gets past his fun stage presence, he's not even my least favourite big bad, maybe even if you discount season 4's impressively contundent last place finish. The most important writer we have to discuss this season, other than Whedon himself, who we'll discuss in depth as the series goes on, is David Greenwald, who wrote Angel, the episode, not the character or the show. He, Well, he also wrote the character in the episode and the character in the show, and he ran the... He wrote Angel the episode. His is one of those names that comes up pretty rarely in discussions of Buffy, but is one of the most important behind the scenes. David Greenwald is a decently prolific writer for Buffy, with a total of 8 credits, but he's also the series co-executive producer, along with Joss Whedon, and by all accounts he's responsible for shaping a lot of how the first few seasons of the show went. In his commentaries on Welcome to the Hellmouth and the Harvest, which are mostly a collection of behind-the-scenes anecdotes, Whedon talks a lot about Greenwald, and how he was responsible for reining in a lot of Whedon's worst excesses when it came to approaching TV the way you'd approach a movie. It's hard to quite put a finger on what and how Greenwald did behind the scenes, but if anything is clear is that it was a lot, and that Buffy wouldn't be the same without him in that position. He'd also go on to be the showrunner for the first three seasons of Angel, the show's life, which is a pretty Pretty massive contribution to the Buffyverse and has some really great material in it. If you know anything about Early Angel, you can maybe get an idea of what Greenwald's contributions as a writer feel like. The uncharitable take is clunky, and the charitable take is dark and atmospheric. I think both of these are true, especially this early on, with Greenwald co-writing the incredibly atmospheric Nightmares with Whedon, which we'll get to soon. The dark and broody but largely forgettable Angel and Whatever the hell Teacher's Pet is meant to be, I'm not touching that one. I mean, it's definitely a dark episode, I guess. It's a bit of a gumball of quality when it comes to David, with some of the best and worst of the season mixed in there, and Greenwald's writing will continue to fluctuate pretty wildly in quality as the show goes on. He will pen bangers like Homecoming and The Wish, and stinkers like Bad Eggs or Reptile Boy. One thing that he does consistently have is heavier themes that don't necessarily elevate the stakes, but do make the consequence of failure feel grimmer than usual, and I think those heavy spots go a long way towards making Buffy what it is, especially with his penchant, and frankly really good hand for, using allegory that's incredibly thinly veiled, but veiled just thickly enough to not be irritating. To get to talk about Angel, the episode, I once again skipped one. Oh my god, it's it's episode 6, The Pack. I'm actually going to once again skip over it to first talk about an episode that I think of as somewhat linked, and not because I'm stalling, The Puppet Show. The link here is these are the two episodes of season 1 that I'm the most defensive of. There's a website called The Fire Phenomenon, which serves as an aggregator for almost every Buffy rankings list on the internet at the time of The Fire Phenomenon's creation, essentially giving an ultimate overview of how the community viewed every episode of the show at the time. 
the worst episode of season one on the website is I Robot You Jane, which comes out at 143 of 144 episodes of the show. Maybe a bit lower than I'd personally put it, but it is a really bad episode. You then get Teacher's Pet at 141 of 144, which is also maybe a tad lower than I'd put it, but not by that much. Never Kill a Boy on the First Date is at 122, which I might personally put a lot lower, and Out of Mind, Out of Sight, which I've not talked about yet, is at 97, which is maybe a little bit harsh, but fair enough and understandable. The one that gets me is The Puppet Show at 94th place, really far down the rankings and 5th worst in the season, which is closely followed up by The Pack's 87th place, 6th worst in the season, and more interestingly, The Pack's 3rd position in The Five Phenomenon's Most Polarized page, a listing of the show's most controversial episodes. I think both The Pack and especially The Puppet Show are excellent episodes which are direly underrated by the community, and it's unfortunate that two of the most successful early Monster of the Week stories are looked down on. I understand why, though. These are two of the silliest episodes in the entire show, which correlates strongly with other silly episodes like Double Me Palace, Inca Mummy Girl, or Bad Eggs, which dominate the bottom of the list. I think it's easy to dismiss a lot of these episodes based on their premises alone, and ignore a lot of the really good work that's going on under the scenes, which is sad because I think a lot of Buffy's strength comes from its wholehearted embrace of silliness. The puppet show might be a goofy story about a talking puppet who's hunting demons, but it also has some really great stuff in it. The beginning scene where the Scoobies are making fun of Giles for having to run the talent show is one of the best group scenes in this entire season. He thought it would behove me to have more contact with the students. I did try to explain that my vocational choice of librarian was a deliberate attempt to minimize said contact, but uh, he would have none of it. Giles, into every generation, is born one who must run the annual talentless show. You cannot escape your destiny. If you had any, a shred of decency, you would have participated, or at least, um, helped. Nah, I think I'll take on your traditional role. You watch. It really shows how comfortable these characters have gotten around each other, and it's got a perfect grasp of their relationship dynamics. Principal Snyder is introduced in this episode, and he's doing his shtick in full force, perfectly landing what makes this character memorable, and dropping some of the best lines he'll ever have. Kids need understanding. Kids are human beings. It's the kind of woolly-headed liberal thinking that leads to being eaten. The episode's atmospheric and gloomy, with a real sense of foreboding, and the central twist, Sid actually being a good guy hunting after a different demon, is well executed, with plenty of fair warning that's easy to ignore. We even get one of the first likable Cordelia moments since the first episode of the show, where she's shown to suffer from stage fright. There's a bunch of really great jokes, a tenser than usual action scene where Giles almost gets his head chopped off, and two different emotional climaxes that both hit well. Morgan turning up dead and Sid sacrificing himself to kill the last demon. It's not like a masterpiece or anything. The characters don't really change in any meaningful way. There's no satisfying thematic crunch in the episode, nothing like that. But it is a really fun ride, and it's well made and very well written throughout. In the notes that I took as I rewatched the season, I have written down every Monster of the Week episode should be at least this good, which I think is pretty high praise. I just think it's a shame that there's this tendency to dismiss episodes with less appealing high concepts just because they seem silly on the surface, since I honestly do think the puppet show is one of the highlights of the first season, and I'm sad that not many people seem to agree with me on that. The Pack is, as mentioned before, one of the most controversial episodes of Buffy. Much like The Puppet Show, its premise is very silly. In fact, it's sort of my go-to haha Buffy is cheesy example. Xander and a few other students are possessed by hyenas and start acting like wild animals in school. It's a really stupid premise. Even Giles thinks so. You're saying that uh, Xander's becoming a hyena? And it's portrayed with all the panache and cheese that it deserves, like this slow-mo walking scene, or the fact that when the students eat Principal Flutie, the explanation is he was eaten by wild dogs. Which is such a ridiculous concept that wild dogs became an in-joke between me and a close friend of mine whenever anything needed explaining that was even slightly weird. The thing that rubs people the wrong way sometimes, and I can see why, is that all of the silliness is used to explore some really disturbing stuff, like 
you know, students eating a man alive, or Xander being incredibly cruel to Willow, or Xander straight up sexually assaulting Buffy, which is something the show says outright. But I think the contrast between the silliness of a few of those scenes with how dark the episode can get is what breathes life into it. The fact that one moment we can be watching Xander menacingly eating a hot dog and then transition into heavy topics makes those dark moments hit all the closer to home, especially because the thing that this episode is a metaphor is adolescents changing people and making them act awful. I'm just taken to teasing the less fortunate. Uh-huh. And uh, there's a noticeable change in both clothing and demeanor. Yes. And, well, otherwise all his spare time spent lounging about with imbeciles. It's bad, isn't it? It's devastating. He's turned into a 16-year-old boy. It fits the whiplash between goofy fun and legitimate darkness thematically. A very similar theme is absolutely central to the second season, in particular to what I'd call its most pivotal moment, the episode Innocence. The Pack is not a perfect episode, nor is it a solid and workmanlike episode like The Puppet Show. We spend a little too long just following the hyena bullies around while they do stuff that doesn't really matter. There's an absolutely awful action scene, and it accidentally sets up the loose end that the hyena kids remember eating a man alive, which feels like something it should acknowledge. But it accomplishes what it sets out to do for the most part, and it's a very good roller coaster ride of an episode on the way there. It's simultaneously fun to laugh at, and manages to be genuinely disturbing. I like it. And I guess this is finally time to talk about Xander's crush on Buffy, which is also a central part of the pack. I had to do it at some point, I guess. In the first two seasons, Xander Harris has a crush on Buffy Summers. This is the biggest mark against a character who I otherwise really, really like. Xander is one of my favourite Scoobies, and I honestly cannot imagine the show without him. He's the heart of the group, he's the emotional centre that keeps everyone around him sane, and he is one of the kindest people on the cast. There's also stuff he does in the first two seasons that I hate, and which would objectively make him a horrible human being if it was a real person. The thing here is, Buffy never has any feelings for Xander at all, and honestly, the only real reason Xander seems to like Buffy is that she's there, and she's hot, and she's not Willow. I mean, the meta reason is that she's the main character, but you know. The romantic tension here is non-existent, and I believe it's meant to be written that way to some extent. The problem, then, is that Xander endlessly pesters Buffy about this in a really annoying way that spoils a lot of their interactions, and Buffy has to remain unaware of it in a way that makes her seem stupid. The worst part is that Xander's crush on Buffy is often used as a plot device to have him do stupid things that cause the plot to move along like ignore her warnings in Teacher's Pet, or actively encourage Buffy to murder a person, Angel, the character in Angel, the episode, because he's jealous of his position. Angel's a vampire. You're a slayer. I think it's obvious what you have to do. It's unlikable, and it hurts the believability of both characters. When I think about Xander, I think of the good stuff he does in later seasons, and I ignore a lot of the awful shit that he does in the name of his crush on Buffy in earlier ones. I also just hate the notion that this can't be a platonic friendship, which seems to be shoehorning this plotline into the show. It's just bad. I do not like it, and I also do not wish to talk about it that much further. It's time for a writer break. The pack is written by some of the less prolific writers for the season, the writing duo Matt Keen and Joe Rinkmeyer, who seem to specialise in making silly, goofy scripts that I personally feel the need to defend. They've only got two episodes of Buffy to their name, writing The Pack this season and Inca Mummy Girl in the next. Not to get ahead of myself, but Inca Mummy Girl is an episode I legitimately like a lot, and which, like The Pack, gets a lot of flack from the community. They're both very goofy fun episodes with a strong emotional core and some sort of unexpected dark punch, be it the darkness of the pack or the quiet sadness that permeates in Kamami Girl, and I think they represent an element of Buffy that I really value. They're also interestingly both Xander-centric episodes, which really nail Xander. 
This duo are maybe the people who most understand Xander other than Joss Whedon himself this early on in the show. Of all the early season writers who disappear from the show after a couple of episodes, they're maybe the people I'm the saddest didn't stay on longer. I think they fit right in with the show's spirit, and they provided some excellent work, though the community at large does seem to disagree. Their excellent grasp on who Xander is would have been invaluable in assuaging how rocky his character could get early on too. It feels like getting glimpses at season 3 Xander in the middle of seasons 1 and 2. They went on to a short but productive career as a duo, writing a whole bunch of episodes for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and Andromeda. As for the puppet show, it's written by some people who are pretty important to early Buffy. It's maybe weird to think of the writing duo Rob Dezotel and Dean Batali as prolific Buffy writers, seeing as they've only got five episodes to their name, but they're a heavyweight presence in the early days of the show, with all five of their episodes concentrated before the 18th episode of the second season, making them the second most prolific writers in the show up until that point, only lagging behind Joss Whedon himself. If we look at all of season 2, Marty Noxon does catch up and tie with them for second place though. By the end of season 2, they've provided 5 of the 34 episodes of the show, which is a really large proportion for a single writing credit. I unfortunately don't have all that much positive to say about them though. For the most part, their episodes range from bad to mediocre, with the one episode they penned that I unequivocally like being the puppet show. In this season, they also pen my pick for worst episode, Never Kill a Boy on the First Date, and they'll continue to write episodes that fail in the same way as Never Kill a Boy does. They're just sort of boring and forgettable, and I struggle to remember what happens in a lot of their season 2 episodes. They also happen to be responsible for my pick for the worst episode of the entire show, an episode which I've fallen asleep watching three separate times, which we'll get to in the second season. That opinion may change as I rewatch more of the show though. As a writing duo, they just feel like they lack a concrete identity, and they don't really stand out in any particular way, other than putting out scripts that I generally don't like. I really don't like writing this. I'm trying to have this looking at writers thing be a positive look at lesser known creatives whose praises are unsung, or at least to spread positivity about less prolific writers, but my honest impression looking through a list of this Geo's Buffy scripts is almost entirely negative. They just don't seem to be able to do what the show's trying to do very well. At least they went on to be incredibly prolific in the world of TV, so I'm sure there's some pretty good stuff in their portfolios. I respect their work ethic if nothing else. All we have left before the finale is another duo of Monster of the Week episodes. This is episode 10 and episode 11, Nightmares and Out of Sight, Out of Mind. Honestly, the only thing holding these two episodes together is the fact that I don't have that much to say about them and they're next to each other chronologically. They're pretty decent Monster of the Week episodes, but they lack the quality of something like Witch or The Puppet Show, while also not falling flat on their face the way iRobot Eugene does. Nightmares is maybe one of the more disappointing episodes in the show, however, because it feels like it should be brilliant. The concept of going through characters' deepest fears should be a great one that teaches us a lot about them as people, but instead we get surface level stuff, like Xander being afraid of clowns or Willow having stage fright, both of which are pretty boring, uninteresting fears. The one thing that we get out of the premise that's unequivocally really, really good is Giles' nightmare sequence, where Buffy has died because of his inadequate guidance, which is so touching, and it's carried so hard by Anthony Head's brilliant performance. I failed. In my duty to protect you. I should have been more cautious, taken more time to train you. But you were so gifted. And the evil was so great. I'm sorry. Brilliant as usual, that is. Incidentally, this performance also really works for the less sad and more just creepy bit, where Giles forgets how to read. I, I can't read. What do you mean? You can read like three languages. Five, actually, on a normal day. The words here don't make any sense. Gibberish. 
the episode's actual story is pretty boring. Like, we just have to help this kid to wake up, but it's fine enough as an excuse for a bunch of interesting and cool imagery to happen, which is definitely the episode's strongest suit. Even if the Nazi clown doesn't tell us anything about Xander, it does have a vibe. This is also the introduction of Hank Summers, Buffy's dad, who plays a pretty important but uninteresting role in this episode, where Buffy is afraid he stopped loving her. Hank is a shockingly unimportant character considering his relationship to Buffy, and his only real impact on the show from this point on is a series of jokes about how he's run off to Spain with his secretary and doesn't see his daughter anymore which admittedly seriously undercuts this episode's message that he still loves Buffy, but it's an amusing enough gag that I can forgive it. He only has like four on-screen appearances through the entire show, and a lot of them are dreams or flashbacks, so he's more of a curiosity than a character. Out of Mind, Out of Sight is maybe the iconic forgettable episode of the season. Whenever I try to list every episode in season one, Out of Mind, Out of Sight is inevitably the one I forget about. Except that's happened so many times that it's now become the one that I always remember that I always forget, so I remember it. It's funny how that always seems to happen. It's a perfectly serviceable Monster of the Week episode with a pretty transparent ha, school as hell metaphor at its core. The girl who gets ignored becomes literally invisible. There's a few things I like in the nitty gritty of the writing, like how Giles actually brings up the idea of the culprit being an invisible person as part of a list of possibilities before the Scoobies figure it out. There are a few possibilities that bear investigating. Uh, someone with telekinesis, um, the power to move objects at will, uh, uh, an invisible creature, um, or possibly a poltergeist. Or this joke about bats that <laughs> made me laugh way harder than it really should have. No, it's a bit of a puzzle, really. Um, I've never actually heard of anyone attacked by a lone baseball bat before. Maybe it's a vampire bat. I'm alone with that one, huh? The episode is brought down by a few things that don't work, like Marcy being completely batshit insane and completely unsympathetic as a result, when she really should be more of a sympathetic villain. Or the weird, ridiculous science explanation that Giles gives when there's a perfectly good Hellmouth right under him as they speak as an excuse. Or the weird-ass FBI invisible children assassination school at the very end, though I do find that enjoyable in a very cheesy sort of way. But the most important stuff to do with this episode is the Cordelia stuff. As of right now, I've mentioned the name Cordelia thrice in this script up until this point, and they were all side mentions that I could have cut out if I really wanted to. That's because, despite being in the credits and prominently featuring in the character introductions in Welcome to the Hellmouth, Cordelia's actually sort of a remarkably pointless character in this season. Her plot significance has been absolutely minuscule. I think the biggest things she's done were being in peril during the events of the Harvest and Witch, neither of which relied on Cordelia being a character we already know. It just sort of made sense to have her there, so she may as well be the one to fill the role, so that we can avoid giving some other actress a SAG card. She's basically been used as comic relief. She'll show up in a scene, act bitchy and condescending, and she'll often do something dumb, and then it will be funny. But Buffy is a show where every single character is consistently funny, and even if it wasn't, there's a perfectly hilarious Xander Harris right there who can fill the role. Up until this point, she's felt like a waste of a character slot. Not a bad presence, mind, but a completely unnecessary one. Out of Mind, Out of Sight actually does something with her, giving her moments of legitimate complexity and exploring why she acts the way she does. It also cuts down on the Cordelia's dumb jokes, instead making her someone who actually engages in class and can intelligently, though pretty selfishly, talk about literature, and someone with enough pattern recognition skills to have recognized the fact that Buffy is the person to go to for protection against the supernatural, which no one else in the school seems to ever figure out. There's an intelligence and an understanding there, and the episode even highlights how Cordelia is sort of what 
Buffy used to be before becoming a Slayer. That's a connection that will go sadly unused for the rest of Cordelia's tenure on the show, which is sad because I think it brings a really interesting dynamic to these characters, especially when you know the behind-the-scenes story where Charisma Carpenter was originally auditioning for Buffy's role. As such, despite the fact that Out of Mind, Out of Sight is forgettable, I actually think it's a pretty important episode which sets Cordelia up for when she eventually joins the Scooby gang full time. It would have been too hard of a pivot to move from Cordelia being fully unlikable in the way she is for most of the season into her being one of the good guys, and I like that there's this little in-between step. All that we have left at this point is the final episode of the season. Prophecy Girl. And this represents a real turning point for Buffy. It's hard to really pinpoint when the different eras of Buffy start and end. It's tempting to say early Buffy, whatever that is, ends here with Prophecy Girl because this is the first episode that feels like the stuff that truly makes Buffy great. It falls right in line with the all time greats like Innocence, Becoming, Graduation Day, Hush, etc., etc., which nothing has until this point. It's this truly character-focused episode where every single person in the cast is completely on point, everyone is fully present, doing their best and growing as people. At the same time, season 2 has a bunch of episodes that are definitively early Buffy, which fit more in line with Teacher's Pet and the puppet show than something like Becoming or Who Are You. The point is, whatever you want to say is the end point of early Buffy, Prophecy Girl is the first time this show truly sings. It's a spectacular episode that's equal parts fun and heartbreaking, especially with the tough subject matter here, where Buffy has been prophesied to die. I praised Sarah Michelle Gellar for her performance in the first few episodes, where she's subtle and completely understands her role, but her Oscar moment, her big showy thing, comes here in this episode in the library scene, where after walking in on Giles and Angel talking about how she's prophesied to die, Buffy refuses her duty as a slayer and breaks down, telling Giles she doesn't want to die. Buffy, if the master rises... I don't care! I don't care. Giles, I'm 16 years old. I don't want to die. It's a legitimately really tough scene to watch, and probably the emotional highlight of this entire season. But the whole episode builds on this tone, and it works with it. The episode has clearly been working with a much higher budget than usual, with much improved cinematography, and it makes for this moody, depressing experience. The scene where the boys are discovered dead in the AV room is a really disturbing one, and it lets Alison Hannigan give her best performance of the season in this scene, where she's finally broken down by the horror of what's been going on around her. Possibly the best aspect of Hannigan's Willow strong core that I went on about earlier is that on the very rare occasions it breaks, it really breaks, and it feels horrible. I'm not okay. I knew those guys. I go to that room every day. And when I walked in there, it it wasn't our world anymore. They made it theirs. And they had fun. Which is important, because this is the scene that motivates Buffy to embrace her duty as a slayer and march herself to her death. And with how absolutely demolished Hannigan looks here, it's really easy to see why Buffy would do this, would feel this need to protect her like this. The one character who's maybe not fully there this episode is once again our problem child, Xander. But it's not for any fault of Prophecy Girls. This is meant to be the capstone to his character arc of lusting after Buffy, and it is. And that's the main problem, it's the capstone of a bad arc. But the way he's handled here, in the episode, is perfect. When he's rejected by Buffy, he's clearly hurt, understandably, and he lashes out. The reason I like this scene is twofold. Unlike much of the rest of the season, Xander's actions here aren't portrayed as reasonable. 
it's very transparent that he's being a dick and that he's not doing the correct thing. Secondarily, you can see that Xander himself does understand that to some extent. He specifically says out loud that he's probably acting out because he's hurt. That's really harsh. Look, I'm sorry. I don't handle rejection well. <laughs> Funny, considering all the practice I've had, huh? and he has lines like, let's not, where he goes out of his way to try to avoid Buffy, because he knows he's just going to say hurtful things to her. I think the feeling of lashing out at someone because you're hurt, despite knowing even in the moment that it's the wrong thing to do, and that just making you even more upset and more willing to lash out is a vicious cycle almost everyone on Earth has experienced, and while it doesn't excuse Xander's actions, it does at least show that he's not a complete shitbag about it. Oh, and the scene where he asks Willow to prom as a backup and she refuses him, despite having been pining for this for the entire season? What do you say? No. Good. What? There's no way. <laughs> Willow, come on. You think I want to go to the dance with you and watch you wish you were at the dance with her? You think that's my idea of hijinks? You should know better. Perfect. There's that strong inner core of hers. That self-respect, that determination that I've been constantly banging on about. I also do think that the way Xander's arc for the season is capped off here is a little odd. I like that he's making progress working through his crush on Buffy, but the thematic implications of him having be the one to bring her back with the kiss of life, aka CVR after she dies, is very strange. If anything, everything about Xander this episode screams that he's not meant for Buffy, and then having his big contribution to the plot be a gesture that, while not romantic in real life, is romantic in the language of cinema, is really odd. You'd think a story where Xander is dealing with rejection wouldn't have his crowning moment be him eventually bypassing that rejection. It gives off weird vibes, and while it does set up Xander's arc in season 2, it's also sort of bad in the moment. If there was a way to set this up so that Xander brings Buffy back to life through a symbolic representation of unconditional friendship that endures a romantic rejection, it would have perhaps been a more powerful moment. Especially since starting in season 2, there's going to be a lot of moments that highlight that what makes Buffy uniquely effective as a slayer is that she's got friends to rely on, and that she's not disconnected from the world she's meant to be defending in the way that slayers usually are. The character who does this setup the best, though, is Giles. He's never been a stoic or self-assured character, but he's at least a composed and reasoned one, which is why seeing him in the absolute state of disarray that he's in through the entirety of this episode is absolutely heart-wrenching. If Sarah Michelle Gellar has her Oscar moment in Prophecy Girl, Anthony Head is definitely getting Best Supporting Actor, with a performance that's maybe less immediately punchy than Gellar's, but so thoroughly distressing and consistent that it heightens the sad, desperate feeling that permeates all of Prophecy Girl. It's helped by the fact that Giles' role in the script is perfect too, and the moment where he breaks and tries to go do Buffy's duty for her is spotless. The warm, almost paternal connection between Giles and Buffy is one of the best aspects of the show, and this is one of its highlights, with all of Giles' logic and composure jumping out the window the moment that he's no longer sure Buffy can overcome her obstacles, replaced with an overwhelming, pure-hearted desire to protect a person who's dear to him, even when it makes no sense for him to try to do so. I don't care what the books say. I defy prophecy, and I am going. There's nothing you can say will change my mind. I know. It's a great follow-up from his Nightmare in Nightmares, which is essentially the outcome everything here is leading him towards. If this was the sort of thing that somehow symbolically brought Buffy back, rather than Xander's continued romantic love for her, I'd be much happier with it, though the exact logistics of how to finagle that into place are beyond me. Cordelia has a curious place in this episode. I just got done praising Out of Sight, Out of Mind for how much progress she made in that episode, coming across as smarter and even starting to create a working relationship with the Scoobies, but she's maybe a little bit too nice and too in the group in this episode. She's actively trying to be nice to Willow, 
admittedly because she wants something from her, but she continues to be polite to her even after she's got what she needs. What's more, she even opens up to her in a way that should be considerably harder for Cordelia than it comes across in the episode, admitting she might actually like the guy she's currently dating. They are good moments, and they flow well coming out of Out of Sight, Out of Mind, and coming into the rest of the episode, where Cordelia coincidentally finds herself as part of the Scooby Gang during the final showdown. What they don't flow well into is the place Cordelia starts the second season in, where she's once again an outsider who doesn't get along well with the Scoobies, spending much of the first half of the season going back through the arc she just sort of had in these last two episodes. It's not really the fault of either of the two seasons, but it is unfortunate, and it negatively affects the show as a whole, even if it doesn't make for bad TV on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. This is potentially explained by the troubled way Buffy was produced. It's a show that always verged on cancellation, with every season running into some sort of issue with networks, and its place as a mid-season replacement during its first season didn't bode well for its future. Until the show did much better than expected, it seemed really likely that it would never get a second season, which is why Prophecy Girl is written in such a way that it could very well be a series finale. This would be a problem which would plague the show for almost its entire run. In fact, due to recurrent difficulties getting renewed, every single season finale in the show's run, other than season 4's, was written to also work as series finale. But Prophecy Girl and the surrounding episodes are maybe where the problem with this approach are most obvious, with Out of Mind, Out of Sight both setting up a rushed arc for Cordelia and hurriedly getting Angel to bring Giles the Codex, which contains the prophecy that drives Prophecy Girl's plot. Still, in a way I really love this approach, because Prophecy Girl does really feel like a last hurrah. Everyone is clearly going all out and it really pays off. It results in a really powerful piece of television that to some extent redeems a lot of the jank leading up to this point. It's a thematically powerful story. This is Buffy's coming of age, in its own way, framed through the lens of death and rebirth. To truly become herself, Buffy must die, and the one thing that keeps her going is her friends and her allies. It's a rejection of the Slayer dogma, usually summarized with a phrase that even this early in the show has been said a lot one girl in all the world. But at the same time, this admission that she has a support system is not a rejection of Buffy's strength. There's a reason why this incredibly iconic outfit she wears in this episode is a contrast. It's a white prom dress worn under a black leather jacket. The visual metaphor is practically screaming at you. It's Buffy's social life working in combination with her life as a slayer, drawing strength from both aspects of herself. It hits the emotional low points well, and it maintains that low tone through a lot of its runtime, starting with Buffy's breakdown in the library, moving on to the second act lowest point where Willow's distraught, Xander is laying in his room listening to country music, and Buffy's going to her death, really hitting the gut punch where the master reveals that the prophecy was self-fulfilling, and that Buffy died for nothing. It eventually comes to a fantastic final catharsis with the immortal line, I may be dead, but I'm still pretty. There is stuff to dislike here, as I've spent the last few or so pages of script discussing, but Prophecy Girl is the first instance of Buffy the Vampire Slayer being the show that I'm utterly in love with. And so ends the first season. It was full of growing pains in figuring out its own identity. In a way, it's fitting that the show is going through the same things that the characters are. This is by far the most tentative season, and the most unsure of itself the show is, trying out weird things that never quite come back, and falling into pitfalls that it really quickly learns to avoid. But still, even by itself, even if the show had never gotten renewed and this season was all we had, I think Buffy the Vampire Slayer would be a worthy watch. There's a ton to love here. It's a very funny show with plenty of heart and which discusses teenage issues with frankness and empathy that's very rare. And it tells a satisfying story about a girl who slowly learns to embrace the two seemingly contradictory parts of herself. Being a teen is really scary. It's when you discover things about yourself that you didn't even imagine were there, and it's also a time where the prospect of adulthood and responsibility looms ever closer and closer. Accepting all of yourself can be very scary, and that's what Buffy goes through here. Realizing that she doesn't need to pick. 
that she can be Buffy the Prom Queen and Buffy the Vampire Slayer at the same time. While these two halves of her will remain in friction throughout the rest of the show, there's never going to be an episode of Buffy like Welcome to the Hellmouth or Prophecy Girl ever again, where Buffy feels the need to abandon one for the other. From now on, there's no Vampire Slayer versus Prom Queen, there's no insurmountable conflict between duty and community, there's just Buffy Summers. That's real tangible character growth, one that most adults have had to go through at some point or another, presented in a package that's entertaining and feels truly empathetic. I mean, I don't think most of us have had to deal with becoming vampire slayers, but I think that's pretty great. Anyways, join me next time when Buffy has to smash a skeleton with a sledgehammer. Like the video if you like the video and subscribe if you want to listen to me ramble like a crazy person more in the future. I thrive on validation and seeing numbers go up, so it makes more likely I'll actually make more stuff if you do that. Bye. Hit the like button. Do it.